Stephen Tatos' end was obscure, murky as if the 1m83 defender had not endeared himself to the hearts of Cameroonians, tragic as if the former Tone Kalara club legend had not skippered the indomitable lions of Cameroon to their best ever display at the 1990 World Cup, and lonely as if at his prime thousands of persons did not storm stadiums to watch him play. If you are a novice in Cameroonian football, you can be forgiven for thinking the melancholic situation surrounding Stephen Tatos' death is new. It's not. Before him, Benjamin Massing, Louis Paul Mfede, Samuel Mbappe Lepe, and scores of other Cameroonian football icons have exited the stage in the most heart wrenching of scenarios. But Tatos hit a different low. He had been sick for several months and the death of his wife a few years ago seemed to have snuffed the excitement of life out of him. Rarely was Tatos seen in public. He accepted to grant only a few interviews, a stark contrast to the gregarious player who was media friendly barely three decades ago. Stephen Tato waned before the very eyes of his most ardent admirers, sports authorities and the country's football decision makers. And in the midst of this, very little seemed to be done to help him weather whatever issues he was dealing with. Compare Tato's plight, dying slowly till he died, to that of another Lions captain, Rigobert Song, who was given all the care at short notice to rescue him from a sudden stroke. Far from being just Cameroon's skipper in two World Cups, Stephen Etatato, the man who was birthed in a corner, was an all-encompassing modern-day defender whose wit and swagger on the sandy and muddy pitches of various towns in the country left fans gladdened. Tato's clinical style of play at the two planetary events, the 1990 and 1994 World Cups, dented the strange paradigm that African defenders were brutes. His ability to dribble with great ease will later motivate a new cast of African defenders who dared to become more technical rather than depend on raw strength. After ensuring that African defenders were treated as genuine threats across the world, Tato set out on a racial crusade, hoping to draw a line in the sand. In 1995, he became the first African footballer to play in Japan when he joined Tosu Futures and was within his one-year stint able to annihilate most of the common nonsensical notions around African footballers, thus becoming a precursor for the likes of Patrick Mboma, Ashile Mana, Michel Pangse Bilong, and many other Africans who made a living playing in Japan. Cognizant of these, some pundits have been questioning how then could this football colossus have been ignored by all those persons he put smiles on their faces as a player. And while this question may warrant some proper brain racking, some of his former teammates have said in the twilight of his earthly journey, Tato had decided to live a life of seclusion, avoiding friends and abhorring visits to his Dragash residence in Yaoundé, as former Lions keeper Vincent Ongandi states. Tato was someone who was not too open these last days because, you know, he was sick and uh, he preferred just to stay in and deal with his sickness, you know, alone. Even though we wanted to help him, to assist him, but he didn't want, you know, people to come around too much because he was that kind of person who didn't want to be assisted. Still, defender Thomas Libby, who played in the 1990 World Cup, believes there should have been a way to make things better for Tato. He was sick a long time ago and uh, for me, we didn't help him to be getting better. 48 hours after Stephen Tato's death, there's been a lot of theories and worries over whether an appropriate environment exists to help current players prepare for retirement and transition properly from football to some other activity. But this seems to be an eternal worry. On Friday, when Stephen Tato gave up the ghost, the scene at the mortuary of the Yaoundé Central Hospital would have stunned everyone. But for a few police officers, 
Stephen Tato's lifeless body was accompanied by just four persons, his son and daughter, his younger sister Alice and his cousin Emmanuel. No Fekafoot official on site, no official from the Ministry of Sports and worst of all, no former teammate around. Who then does the nation recognize and honor? Tato stood by the national flag. Tato lifted the green, red, yellow colors to make Cameroon proud in front of the entire world. Tato was a legendary captain of the dreaded Indomitable Lions. I ask again, who does the nation and the football family recognize and honor? Those who criticize the government are sometimes labeled enemies of the state. Those who pick up arms against the state are termed enemies of the state for understandable reasons and treated accordingly. But what reward do they reserve for loyalists? As a player and football official in different capacities after his career, Tato was a loyalist. If loyalists are treated this way, I say again if loyalists are treated this way, sorry, I cannot finish this sentence. But what a paradox that a man who wielded such influence and pulled crowds seemed alone at death. A glaring reminder of life's ephemeral nature. As Stephen Eta Tato bows out of the stage, it's not just a football legend that exits, but a colossus and a lightning rod for change, whose indelible marks on and off the pitch will forever be remembered. Whose indelible marks on and off the pitch will be remembered? By who? Not the Cameroon government. It is a tool of French colonialists to destroy the existence of southern Cameroons and its people. Not the citizens of La Republique du Cameroon. They are too deprived to remember anything other than seeking after their most basic native needs 24-7. Captain Tato remembered. A man can try to be better than where he came from, like Captain Stephen Tato did. But the question will always be asked, when the lights are turned off and the cameras are gone, where is he from? If he is not from the right place, especially in Africa, the invisible but existing caste will come into play and determine his place regardless of his deeds and accomplishments. Like Southern Cameroon's end, Captain Stephen Tato's end could not be better than that of where he came from. Southern Cameroon's did not end well. She obeyed the Germans, she obeyed the British, and their Nigerian partners. She obeyed the United Nations. But she died alone on the runway in Teko on October 1, 1961 the day chosen by international law, voted on by the United Nations to be an independent country. The police officers near Captain Tato's dead body were not there to protect or to serve the dead man. They were there just as the British were on the tarmac in Tiko on October 1, 1961 to make sure Tato was dead, to make sure he was buried once and for all times, never to be remembered. Excuses and apologies may surface now to cover up and say he refused help and therefore deserve what happened to him, knowing fully well that he had his own story to tell and knowing very well that he cannot tell it now. But make no mistake, Captain Tato had his reasons why he was silent and withdrawn, rarely seen in public, Southern Cameroonians know and understand how it is to be that way and why. For over half a century now, the United Nations, the British and her Nigerian collaborators, the French and her colonial Cameroon state thought Southern Cameroons was withdrawn, rarely seen in public and dead. 
but that was only a thought. We are not a thought. We exist in flesh and blood, on a land in which we obeyed the commands of foreigners. It has taken us time to learn that the world runs on more than wishes and fair play. Today we have agreed that the wishful thinking southern Cameroons should be buried for good and give way for Ambazonia to rise, never to fall, no more. Ambazonia must assume her place on earth and bring home all her sons and daughters. Captain Tato's statute of remembrance will be built in Ambazonia. That is where he belongs, where we all will celebrate his prowess, celebrate his reign at the top of his craft in a foreign and hostile land. Rest in peace, Captain, till we meet again back home. Thank you.